You're listening to The Revolution of Regenerative Medicine, a podcast with me, Dr. Gregory Lawrence. Well, hey guys, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm gonna introduce myself. This will potentially be intended as a podcast. So I'm Dr. Gregory Lawrence. Uh, We're in Memphis, Tennessee right now. And as we were talking just a little while ago, we figured out that Tennessee is what? The center of the universe, right? (laughs) Very few of us started out here, but uh, we're all here now. those of us that did start here are still here, so uh, maybe our patients down the road will uh, recognize that uh, Memphis is the center of their universe, especially with this exciting new medical technology that we're gonna be talking about. So um, just to kind of set the stage, um, all you guys um, that are here are either patients of mine or are related to patients of mine. I've had a close relationship with some of you guys or your family, and. Um, you're all here because really you motivated me to do something in my practice um, that we're going to talk about here in just a little bit and um, it's going to probably bless a lot of people so the the title of what we're talking about is cell surgery Uh, i'm intentionally staying away from the term uh, stem cell i may accidentally slip up and use the term the reason i don't intend to use that term is it's being misused so much. Uh, Probably 10 or 15 years ago, this type of technology started to appear on the medical horizon and um, it has so much promise and it's been recognized people in different industries, including the makeup industries and the beauty and the skin industries, that you're finding that uh, there are potions out there that, uh, that the word stem cell sort of become magic. So just because you hear something as a stem cell uh, doesn't mean that you really know what it is. It could be anything from uh, something that came out of a spear of broccoli. And somehow, I don't know if that's gonna help you or not, but uh, so we'll, we'll, we're gonna be more scientifically accurate and technical. So the other thing that I wanna say is that all you guys have uh, been kind enough to uh, uh, be willing to give up some of your uh, 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 private information, uh, and, uh, selected, and, and uh, uh, we're going to be really selective about that, and it's going to be minimal, but uh, we appreciate uh, the transparency that you guys have uh, that's going to help this be a, a, a podcast that I think people really will enjoy. Um, and so for the record, you guys have agreed to have this conversation, and we've gotten uh, uh, consent in writing from you guys, and you have the uh, ability to later uh, uh, change something that you don't want to uh, uh, be, remain in this podcast. So we're going to talk about cell surgery. Now cell surgery is really a, a part of something that's new to medicine and I would just call the, this general umbrella as being regenerative medicine. Uh, this is the part of regener- med- regenerative medicine that's cell based. Uh, pro- possibly uh, coming a little bit before that um, was something called platelet-rich plasma, uh, which is also considered a second arm of regenerative medicine. And this was the uh, really neat discovery uh, that we give credit to the orthopedic surgeons as determining that uh, you can take a patient's own blood and through special processing, take most of the red blood cells away and leave the platelets and activate the platelets sometimes uh, purposefully or sometimes let them naturally activate themselves in the surgical field and be able to get healing that happens at a much faster rate. So it'd be really typical for an orthopedic surgeon to do some type of a tendon repair and um, use the patient's blood to generate uh, growth factors from platelets. Really, really neat. Uh, This is sort of comes under the uh, title of where there's a will, there's a way or where there's a a need you're going to find you're gonna find a solution. The orthopedics work with a relatively avascular surgical field and any surgeon will tell you that if you don't have a good blood supply to a surgical field, you're very unlikely to get a good healing result. So the orthopedic guys figured out what to do about that. And then I would add one other thing to regenerative medicine. I think that uh, uh, bioidentical hormones, BHRT, has become such a powerful tool. Uh, There's all kinds of data coming out that shows that maybe we haven't, um, we maybe misread some of the previous data. Uh, And I don't wanna go down too much of a bunny trail, but just over the last week, I saw two studies that indicated 
that men's best friend ought to be testosterone. We've been really concerned that maybe um, we're making men feel better and making a more lean body mass, but we could be causing uh, their blood to become thicker and for them to be a little bit more prone to a heart attack or a stroke. And of course, doctors, Hippocratic Oath, you know, do no harm. And so it was really, really uh, cool to realize that we had some limited data that suggested to us that we didn't have to worry about that. And just over the last um, month, we've had at least two studies that came out that have indicated an incredible safety profile for testosterone. I'm not going to mention those uh, uh, specifically, but the two studies uh, were, one of them involved about 80,000 men and the other one was a, a relatively small study, close to 600 men. But even the small study of 600 men, the data was so dramatic, like if you were not on testosterone over the period of the study, you had um, uh, about uh, 50 to 60 of those men had an event, a brain event or a heart event that was non-fatal. If you were on testosterone, it was goose egg, zero events. Uh, a stunning study, I think, that's going to really change medicine. So I consider the BHRT to also be part of regenerative medicine um, and uh, because they all work through some of the same pathways. So the first thing to really establish is something uh, with regard to definitions. You guys are all in the room old enough to have gone through the controversy of hearing about the government regulations and all the politics behind embryonic stem cells. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of concern, a lot of it was justified. Um, we didn't want women to be uh, misused or there to be abortions that took place to harvest uh, human tissue for another human's benefit. And so there was a lot of uh, uh, hand wringing about, you know, how do we handle uh, this potential new technology and, you know, we all want to do the right thing. And it was a struggle, it was difficult. Um, we're really blessed to really not have to worry about that argument anymore, even though we do have some uh, 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 fetal stem cell, embryonic stem cell lines that are out there that are used for research. Um, we've really come to find that we just don't need um, that anymore. We're able to get what we need from other sources. So you're going to hear a lot about over the years, you're going to hear about birth cells. Birth cells would include cord cells, uh, placental cells, chorionic cells, amniotic cells. Um, these are all cells that are, are closely associated with birth. And the idea has always been that if you can catch cells early on, they have a lot more of a potential to become what you want them to be. And so um, you guys have lived through, you or your, your kids having kids, and they're being, being very vogue to really consider whether you should bank the cord of your baby or not because your baby might need those cells down the road and so those are frozen in a lab and they're available. Very interesting, those are starting to be used now. But those, are, but those birth cells are, are a big area where we may continue to have, uh, see some, some fruit. But the air, other area that has really, really blown up uh, traditionally, uh, the cancer doctors were using uh, what's called an autologous, um, and then the other one is an allogenic transfer of cells. This would be either you would use your own uh, stem cells out of your blood, peripheral cells, um, or you would use a matched donor. Um, and sometimes this would be peripheral blood, sometimes this would be bone marrow. Um, those are, the, those are the, the, the cells that I think a lot of people have heard of. And of course the idea is after a patient is going through cancer therapy, uh, those rapidly growing cells can be as susceptible to the chemotherapeutic agent as the cancer is. And when those are gone, you, you lose the ability to make blood and to heal yourself. And so uh, basically a transfusion of some of these life-giving cells are what, what's been needed. So what's changed? Well, what's changed is, uh, and this explains a little bit about why I'm at the party. I'm a, a cosmetic surgeon who about 50% of my practice is cosmetic surgery for the last uh, 10 years or so. The other half of it, small part of it's concierge medicine. Uh, bigger part of it is uh, uh, injectables, Botox, fillers, uh, laser, and uh, uh, that's kind of what my practice looks like. One of the things that has been an incredible tool for us has been liposuction. Uh, it, it, liposuction is, is more than just taking a, 
area of the body that's a little uh, thick and making it a little thinner, it's really sort of become something much more than that. We take the fat out and uh, one of my uh, colleagues in uh, San Antonio, Texas, Mario Diana, uh, really pioneered this idea among uh, reconstructive plastic surgeons of being able to take fat and put it to a breast after a woman has breast cancer and needs reconstruction. The idea was, oh, you know, this is expanders and implants. And uh, uh, Dr. Diana said, no, you know, this is a really, really great role for fat. And um, uh, for a while, you know, his societies, you know, scorned him and said, no, you can't do this, this isn't right. And now it's become acceptable uh, mainstream uh, 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 tissue uh, grafting. Uh, we also do the grafting uh, to other areas of the body, to the face, for women that have aging issues. Um, one of the things that's replaced, uh, there used to be a, a, a procedure where we put implants in the buttocks of a, you, a woman, usually not so they would have a better cushiony seat, but they would kind of want their curves, um, although the, uh, the former reason is an appropriate reason to do it. Uh, the, uh, but those, those implants were very problematic. They would, uh, they would a lot of times uh, uh, just work their way out of where, you, where they were positioned. They were, there would be an opening of the incision. And so when we discovered that we could actually graft fat uh, to the buttocks, that was a really, really big jump. So as that was happening, that's where I came in. My cosmetic uh, surgery colleagues in Southern California, who 10 years ago were on the cutting edge, were taking out fat and they were figuring out what is, you know, what do we do to this fat to make the graft work better? Do we, do we spin it down? Do we add something to it? What do we take out of it? Is there any processing that we need to do? Do we just gravity, um, uh, let it decant by gravity with minimal uh, manipulation? And we just really didn't know. And so doctors tried all kinds of different things. And um, we also traveled across the world. And some of our colleagues um, uh, across the globe looked at us like we were crazy and didn't we realize what kind of magic was in that fat. And they told us what they were doing. And so that sort of made cosmetic surgeons all of a sudden jump onto the scene and say, hey, wait, maybe fat can perform just as well or better than some of the other tissues that we've transferred before, like bone marrow or, or peripheral uh, stems. So it's been a really, really great ride. And, and to be honest, I have sat on the sideline for probably about three or four years going to cosmetic surgery medical meetings and hearing my colleagues literally walk away from their successful cosmetic surgery practices because they've recognized that this really fulfilled all that they ever wanted to do in medicine. They kind of been there and did that and had a great cosmetic surgery practice, but they kind of thought back to why we went to medical school and why we became doctors, and they realized the incredible power that we had in being able to do what we call cell surgery or, uh, or, or using SVF. I'm gonna talk about stromal uh, vascular fraction here in a minute, make sure you understand the terms. But the main thing to you, for you to understand is the difference between fetal embryonic type cells, birth cells, and these other cells that we're using that either adipose derived or bone marrow derived. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that needs to be recognized is there's a big difference between uh, natural occurring cells and engineered cells. There, it may be very well that um, taking out a cell line, manipulating them in certain ways, we may be able to make them more powerful for certain things. We just don't know. As far as how many million cells you need to have a clinical effect, which system you should use, and should it be relatively cellular or more acellular for certain conditions, we just don't know because when we do the harvesting, we are removing, if we're talking about adipose-derived um, cells, we're removing basically everything from around the fat. And if you can just kind of visualize it, cells, whether they're skin cells or whether they're uh, fat cells, they, they occupy a certain amount of space. And then between them is just an incredible amount of acellular activity and cellular activity. So let me just paint a picture for you. If you were, uh, I'm a Star Trek guy, 
and if you were to sort of beam, in, if you were, if you could make yourself really small and beam yourself into somebody's fat compartment, you know, whether it's on their low back or their their love handles or their inner thighs or whatever, you would you would have an 85% chance of landing in a fat cell. They take up a lot of space in those fat compartments, an adipose cell. But if you had x-ray vision, which I'm sure Star Trek people had, <laughs> and you looked around, only 15% of the cells around you would be fat cells. 85% of them would be something other than fat cells. You know, as a surgeon, that was crazy to me. Like I said, I had a original board certification was in family medicine, but then I did uh, high-risk OB, um, did a surgical fellowship, uh, did a lot of surgery in the hospital before I retrained in cosmetic surgery. And, you know, when we used to cut through fat, we just thought, well, there's just fat and it barely bleeds and there's hardly any blood vessels there. Well, it was an amazing thing to, for me to realize that 85% of the cells are not fat cells. So, it was, so the, the crazy thing is that whoever first realized what was all between those cells is, is just an incredible thing. In fact, about three or four years ago, I picked up using uh, a new technology called uh, Matricem by a company called Acel. And what it is, is it's a porcine or pig bladder that's desiccated, dried out, all the cellular elements are taken out, and it's basically just what's in between the bladder cells in a pig's bladder. And you can get it in powder form, you can get it in some sheets. And it has done some things for my surgeries that have been amazing. And the company talks a lot about, there's all these messages in this A-cell, or this matrix stem by A-cell, that is, um, acellular matrix is, the, is what the general term, there's other products in the industry as well. But they do, they do all kinds of messaging and you just put it into your surgical field and the tissue does much better than it would otherwise do. In fact, there's, a, there's an internet uh, uh, story about one of the developers of it who accidentally hacked his, the end of his finger off in an accident. And of course he worked for the company that made this you know, powdery substance and he put it on his finger and his tip of his finger grew back. So it just does some really, really kind of amazing things. So as we talk about um, cell surgery, uh, we really, really are talking about everything else that's with those cells between the fat, if we're talking about adipose derived. The orthopedic surgeons uh, tend to lean towards doing bone marrow procedures, and they're really um, doing a lot of great work to advance bone marrow work. And some of us look at the data and we think that the future is in adipose. But we certainly think that uh, nobody knows the answer right now. And, and what we're able to do is pretty amazing in some circumstances, but we're still in our infancy as far as being able to actually predict um, what we need to do to make a patient have uh, a best, the best result depending on what kind of condition they have. Thank you for listening to this episode. Be sure to subscribe to my podcast, The Revolution of Regenerative Medicine. I'm Dr. Gregory Lawrence, and I look forward to you joining me again soon. Bye.